Our speaker this evening is Chris Barrett. He's a professor of applied economics and management, as well as professor of economics at, at Cornell. His degrees are from Princeton, Oxford, and the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And he's a fellow of numerous professional societies. Dr. Barrett is a leading scholar in international agricultural policy and its relation to sustainability and prosperity. And he's done a great deal of field work in Africa. He works on really hard problems related to food production and distribution and has a recognized talent for explaining the hard choices to lay audiences like ourselves. However, he is also one of our few speakers to also be interviewed and to appear on The Daily Show. <laughs> Dr. Barrett taught at Utah State at the beginning of his academic career and is glad to have this opportunity to return to the Rocky Mountain region. Let's give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Barrett. Thank you very much, Alan and, and Bob, and thank you to all of you for, for being here this evening, uh, taking interest in this topic, and for receiving me so warmly in Steamboat. It really is a pleasure to be back in the Rockies. I, uh, I, I've been at Cornell for 17 years now. My wife and my families are both back east, so it was natural for us to, to move back and get our kids a little closer to grandparents and extended family. But you sort of miss these mountains. They're rather remarkable. So, so I appreciate the opportunity to have a little hike this morning. It was really a treat. Um, and I look forward to a conversation with you after, after giving you a little bit of an overview of a, of a book I edited that came out about 18 months ago. So today it's really important to keep in mind that at the end of World War II, feeding the world was a really daunting proposition. At that time, we produced only about enough food to reliably feed two, maybe two and a half billion people. And distribution problems were considerable, as they are today. But we've seen a remarkable improvement in food production and therefore access to food around the world, such that today, with a population of 7.3 billion, roughly, we could feed absolutely everybody a fully nutritious diet if we could work out distribution systems so that there was equitable access to the food produced around the world. But we, even with the many problems we have in distribution, we still reliably feed more than 6.2 billion people get enough macronutrients, enough protein and calories any given day. So that we have maybe a billion people, the accounting here is, is open to lots of technical dispute, but we have maybe a billion people who go to bed hungry at night today, on any given night. But that number should be kept in mind at the same time as we recall that in the course of, of 70 years, we've tripled our ability to feed people in the world, which is a really remarkable accomplishment when you think of what does it take to produce food. That the land area cultivated around the world has only expanded by about 12 to 15 percent in those 70 years, that this tripling of output is largely a product of technological progress. It's largely due to significant improvements in how we generate the foods that you and I enjoy. Now, the, the nutritional challenge around the world is a little more complicated than just giving everybody adequate calories. And in particular, the bigger and more vexing challenge, frankly, is the micronutrient challenge, the challenge of getting everybody enough minerals and vitamins especially because that depends on fruits, vegetables, and animal source foods much more than it does basic grains. And there are far more people who suffer micronutrient deficiencies today than there are people who suffer hunger manifest in, in, in physical sensation of, of not enough calories. But nonetheless, the progress here is truly astounding. And that progress has paid enormous dividends that we sometimes overlook very easily because we take for granted how easy it is for all of us in this room to acquire adequate food to sustain ourselves, and how easy it is for most people we would know to be able to feed ourselves. 
the, the growth in, in food production and improvements in food distribution increased crop yields by 20 to 25 uh, percent over the course of the 1950s to 1980s or late 70s really brought down real food prices, inflation-adjusted food prices, depending upon the crops you want to include in your market basket, brought food prices down anywhere from 30 to 65% because production growth was outpacing demand growth. And as a result, diets, healthy diets became much more affordable. And with more affordable diets, we could see much more investment by poorer families in children's education. And we saw rapid improvements in educational attainment, especially among low and middle income populations. We saw far faster increases in child survival rates than we had seen any time in human history. And there are obviously lots of other changes taking place at the same time, but improved nutrition is a central part of the story of improved living conditions over the course of the post-World War II era. And it's helped enable unprecedented economic growth and what some historians and psychologists have referred to as the long peace, the long period since World War II when there hasn't been outright conflict between the world's major, major powers, outright warfare. The problem is we take it all for granted. And that the successes of the post-war era agricultural economy around the world and I say agricultural economy because I will talk about production systems, but I also mean distribution systems, the trade and post-harvest processing storage and, uh, and wholesaling and retailing that gets food from farmers to an increasingly urban population. So the agricultural economy, the food systems transformation over the past 70 years or so has been truly astounding, unprecedented in human history and has gone hand in hand with an extraordinary reduction in poverty rates around the world. In 1980, something on the order of 93% of East Asia lived on $2.50 a day or less. Today, that's down to 30%. I mean, this is an historically unprecedented mass migration out of poverty. And if there is a single cause of it, it's been improvements in food systems that have enabled better nutrition, better health, enabled families to invest in education, enabled industrialization, and have led governments to take it all for granted. It induced complacency. And that complacency has been manifest in sharply reduced investment in agriculture. Agriculture is a very peculiar sector because you don't solve a problem permanently. You only can solve problems temporarily because the agricultural system is a delicate balance in nature of pests and pathogens against humans who are trying to domesticate intrinsically wild species that we've intentionally mutated for quite some time. And there's a constant evolution of pests and pathogens as well as the abiotic pressures, think of climate change in particular, but also changes in soils, et cetera. That means you've got to constantly work just to keep pace with the change in the underlying stresses in the agricultural system. And technological innovation in agriculture is almost always, not always now, but predominantly about stress tolerance. So increasingly we're working at, at improved nutrient delivery. We're trying to put vitamins and minerals into foods that historically did not express those in human diets. But it's, it's about stress tolerance primarily. And when you don't invest, you cease to be able to maintain the capacity to resist growing stresses in the system. And so we saw reductions in agricultural R&D expenditures by governments around the world of something on the order of 1% per year in real terms, starting in about 1975 and continuing through till really only about five or six years ago. And it's not a mistake that five or six years ago is when we started to see it turning. And we saw a sharp decrease in the proportion of international aid, the development assistance provided to low and middle income countries, which in 1980 was about 15 to 20% focused on agriculture. And by the time of uh, 2003, 2005, was down to three or 4%. So complacency took over because people thought the Green Revolution had solved the problems. And some of you will know what the Green Revolution is. It's a, it's a period in which there was significant investment in agricultural R&D. 
primarily targeted at the main staple crops, wheat, rice, and maize. One a plant breeder, Norman Borlaug, the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for his accomplishments in advancing agricultural research that reduced the number of hungry people in the world. And that kind of high watermark of ag R&D and focus on food systems in the 70s and 80s receded as people began to think we have this problem solved. And that complacency manifests itself in a very predictable but very unpleasant fashion starting in 2007. Supply growth slowed. Yield growth in the major crops was three to 5% a year in the peak years of the Green Revolution. By the time we got to the earliest years of this millennium, yield growth was down at about 1% a year. Meanwhile, demand growth was accelerating not because of population growth, although population growth was important, but population growth was slowing, but income growth, especially in the middle income countries, to a lesser degree low income countries, was accelerating. And the demand for food is especially strong among low and middle income people. You give them an extra dollar, their propensity to spend an added dollar on food is five to eight times that of us because they're eating much more basic diets. And as they go through a nutritional transformation from eating only basic grains to eating more animal source foods, well then food grain starts to be turned into feed grain at a conversion inefficiency, turning the grain calorie into a meat calorie or a milk calorie or an egg calorie. You lose something on the order of 40 to 90% of the calories, depending upon exactly what form you eat an animal source food in. So the growth in incomes, the transformation of diets, meant that demand growth was accelerating as supply growth was slowing. And right around the turn of the millennium, we saw a switch. And we began to see that supply growth was now not keeping up. And this manifests itself in a very predictable way. If you look at this, this uh, this blue line, which is the FAO, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, food price series. This is time starting in 1990. You see that food prices were volatile but relatively stable and hit a minimum right around the turn of the millennium, right around when demand growth began to outpace supply growth. If you look longer term, food prices have been on a decline. They hit a minimum right at the turn of the millennium, basically. And then they began a slow march upwards. Now, one of the things about foods or any storable commodity is that you won't see a sharp increase in prices right away. You have to see a, a steady degradation of the, the stocks that are held in silos and warehouses and farmers' bins. But once you start to see a sufficient reduction in stocks, prices will spike. And that's exactly what happened in late 2007, 2008, especially in rice markets. We saw price spikes emerge. And these were the completely predictable consequence of the neglect of agricultural systems, food systems in particular, because we thought we had the problem licked. The slow growth of productivity meant that we suddenly were down to historic lows in terms of the months of, of human consumption coverage available in global stocks. Prices collapsed again, but that was because the global economy tanked. That was a Lehman Brothers effect. That wasn't an agricultural systems effect. And then prices came up again very rapidly in 2011. Different commodities leading the way. It was primarily wheat in 2011. It was rice in 2008. In 2012, there was a slightly more muted price spike in, in maize and corn. Prices have come back down a bit, indeed fairly sharply this last year, due almost entirely to oil prices. Oil prices are, are fairly closely correlated with food prices for a range of reasons I could explain later if people want. But the bottom line is that food prices today are like 25% higher than they were at the turn of the millennium. And any credible model you will look at that will predict these things out at 10 to 20 to 50 year horizons says food prices are coming back up. That we've seen relatively low food prices for this past year because oil prices are unusually low. 
because farmers and processors responded to the very high prices of a couple years ago by investing in added capacity, and we had a very predictable supply response. So we should expect food prices to rise. All the models tell us that, and I don't know of any really good reason to believe that prices won't continue to rise. Now, prices also became very unstable during this period, which caused a lot of unrest for governments, made it kind of tricky for people who invest in commodity markets. The stability is dampened down a bit again, as depicted in that red line. But the key here is, if supply growth is slower than demand growth, you should expect there to be upward pressure on prices. And you should expect at some moments that's going to erupt into a price spike. It's, it's the inevitable consequence of the basic economics of commodities. Why should we care? In 2011, I got a phone call from the CIA. And that's an unusual call to get, right? <laughs> You pick up and you first you pull out your cell phone and I text my son saying, what are you up to? <laughs> Figuring maybe this is a prank or maybe he's done something really stupid and now I've got a family problem on my hands. And so I, I spoke with this person from the CIA who said, there's this problem of food riots. And we knew this problem existed in 2008. There were 48 different recorded food riots in developing countries in 2000 late 2007, early 2008. These are depicted on this graphic, which comes from a, a nice study by some researchers in the Boston area. The red lines depict food riots. They're labeled with a country, so Burundi had one death. The parenthetical numbers are the number of deaths recorded in that riot. And what jumps out at you right away in a graphic like this, of course, is that food riots are really concentrated in moments of high food prices, which is pretty intuitive, right? Not that many people riot when you're getting a good deal on your daily bread. So why did the CIA call? Well, the CIA called because they realized they had no clue what was going on. Like so many governments, they had underinvested in understanding and contributing to the global food system. And now there were all these claims in the popular media that the Arab Spring of 2011, which some of you may recall in Tunisia, which was the first of the, of the countries to have a, a government overthrown, and the, the very visible riots in the streets of Tunis were purportedly sparked by the self-immolation of a baguette dealer who was protesting the high price of wheat and wheat flour that was making it very hard for him to sell bread to take care of his family, so he set himself on fire in public, and that precipitated, supposedly, the riots in Tunis that led to the overthrow of the government. Well, it was a much more complicated story than that, as, as you would expect. But the, the key thing here is that several other wheat importing countries facing wheat price spikes were suddenly suffering very serious political unrest in a region that is very sensitive to US geostrategic interests and the US intelligence community was a, at a bit of a loss to explain what was going on, what could be done, what policy instruments are available to us or to our friends that can be deployed to help keep a lid on this so that we don't have this contagion effect with lots of countries suffering government overthrows. And so that's why food prices are suddenly of interest to a broader community than just those of us who think about food policy and food security in general. Now the problem is that simply observing that there are high prices correlated with riots doesn't mean that high prices are causing riots or causing unrest or causing government overthrow. Indeed, if you think about this carefully, there are 200 and some countries in the world. There was only one government that fell due to food price riots in 2008, Haiti, and there are a whole lot of other explanations for that government falling. I'll come to the one other government that fell in a moment. There are a lot of omitted factors that go in here that are correlated with both unrest and with high prices, climate being a big obvious one, that we know there's a huge body of evidence now that high temperatures lead to unrest. High temperatures lead to episodes of single person on single person violence, higher rates of murder and assault, leads to higher rates of, of street riots, it leads to higher rates of civil warfare and guerrilla warfare. 
Um, it also, higher temperatures also, once you get beyond 30 degrees Celsius, lead to fairly sharp drop-offs in crop yields. And when you see a drop-off in crop yields, you commonly see an increase in prices. So this may be just sort of spurious correlation that's going on. Moreover, most of the countries that suffered high prices, because everybody draws on the global food market, with the possible exception of North Korea, uh, everybody else is in the global food market. 200 plus countries, most of them don't appear on this chart. So, you know, the dog that doesn't bark is always part of the story you need to look at. And there were a lot of dogs that didn't bark in, in the high food price spike settings of 2008, 2011. Why? We have to ask the question not just what caused places like India, Somalia, Tunisia, Egypt, et cetera, to suffer serious unrest, but what caused so many countries to not have unrest, especially in Latin America, by the way. If you look at that list, you'll notice a striking absence of countries from Latin America, and I'll come back to that in a moment. The key takeaway here was that food security worries spark unrest when they're mixed with some other broader set of injustices. So without going into all the details, many of which are spelled out in the chapters in this, this book, Food Security and Sociopolitical Stability, a food price spike can be a very large straw that helps to break a camel's back, but it is very rarely the direct cause of the underlying problem. And therefore, the key thing for policymakers to keep in mind is that whatever policy instrument you use doesn't do greater harm in trying to treat a symptom than the symptom itself. So you need to address the underlying cause, and I'll come to that in a moment. And this is where we start to see where the more insidious effects of high food prices come, more insidious effects in terms of their effects on the stability of governments and the stability of societies. And the real thing that causes me worry about a high food price environment is that high food prices are both a cause and a consequence of increased demand for rural resources that are fixed. You know, Mark Twain said in the 19th century when there was a land rush in the, in the United States, he said, buy land, they don't make it anymore. And Twain, like in so many things, was right. It's hard to make more agricultural land. So agricultural land values have gone up a lot. People, people like Alan and me, who are university faculty who have our, our uh, pensions in TIA CREF, well, TIA CREF is the largest institutional investor in farmland in the developing world in the world. Now, it always astonishes me at talking to university audiences where people will talk about you know, the, the horrors of foreign investment in farmland in the developing world, and you ask them, well, where do you keep your pension? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, most of us are blissfully unaware of this. It, you know, it sort of crimps our, our moral outrage bones a little bit. But the, the demand for food causes demand for land and demand for water, something you can appreciate out west, demand for genetic material, the rush to be able to access accessions of, of animal and plant germplasm has been really pronounced since 2008. And it's the competition for the underlying rural resources on which agricultural systems fundamentally depend that is probably the most dangerous thing facing governments all around the world because this is where you can get really deep-seated grievances. A price spike, almost by the definition, is temporary. You know, it comes up, it comes back down. But once you start to see a sudden transformation in the rules of control over water and land, as you can appreciate out west, now you've got a completely different setting in which people become deeply aggrieved and you pit one subpopulation against another. And in a place that already has grievances, that's a recipe for very serious problems such as in Madagascar. So this is the, the main square in Tanarivu, the capital city of Madagascar. Madagascar had a president, an incredibly successful agribusinessman, Marco Vulumanan, uh, who was the richest man in the country. Uh, so imagine Bill Gates being president here. And there were lots of grievances against Ravulumanan. He was not always the most able listener. He was accused sometimes of bits of corruption. Uh, people in the countryside often thought he neglected them. I mean, many of the same litany of complaints you hear of leaders in many countries. Ravulu Manan made a fatal error. Daiwu Logistics, 
the South Korean conglomerate, seeing very high rice prices and being very concerned because there's really no spare arable land and water in Korea to expand rice production appreciably, they were concerned to be able to lock in a source for rice for Korea. So they went to the Madagascar government and they struck a deal. 1.3 million hectares of prime rice land, roughly a third of the country's arable cropland, was leased to Daewoo Logistics under terms that were not made transparent. More than half of the population of Madagascar grows rice, so they were automatically displacing lots of farmers. And that was the straw that tipped the balance in Madagascar. After the Daewoo Logistics deal broke, people took to the street. The country was taken over by a 30-something disc jockey, literally. Disc jockey of a radio station in Tananarivo became the, the acting president. He took power with the backing of the military. Uh, and it was all a grievance over land. It was all a grievance over a crucial resource that had become appreciably more valuable because demand for rice was rapidly outpacing supply growth in rice, especially productivity growth in rice, mainly in other places. And the Philippine government struck a crazy deal in buying rice from a couple of different exporters that caused a precipitous uptick in rice prices. Daiwu panicked. They struck a deal with the government that didn't think through what are the implications for our people, and the people rioted over through the government. Madagascar has been in free fall since, since January of 2009 as a result. It's, it's a truly tragic case, a uh, case that matters a lot to me. I did my dissertation field work in rural Madagascar. It's got a very dear spot in my heart. But land grabs, as these things are sometimes known, can sow real discontent. Now, I want to be careful here because Lots of rural Africa and rural Asia and Latin America, for that matter, are heavily undercapitalized. So investment in land, including foreign investment in land to improve agricultural performance is not automatically a bad thing. But you've got to be careful about how you work these deals. If you're seen as taking people's patrimony, people's you know, core land on which their livelihoods depend, you shouldn't be surprised if they're going to be up in arms or literally pull out small arms. And it's not just land. Uh, we're seeing this increasingly on the open oceans. The capture fisheries, the marine capture fisheries range has been expanding by one degree longitude per year. The last 20 years, right now, more than three quarters of the continental shelves are at or beyond uh, maximum sustainable harvest in ocean capture fisheries. And we're starting to see episodes of fish wars, small scale fish wars between competing fleets. Water is the thing that really spooks the intelligence agencies in Europe and North America. Because think of places like the Nile, think of places like the Euphrates, and what the potential consequences of a battle, or the Mekong, what the potential consequences of a battle over water access in these major river systems that cut across national boundaries could be. I've already mentioned gene grabs. There is a real concern among the plant science community, to a lesser degree animal scientists, over the increasing acquisitiveness of some multinational corporations and some national governments, China in particular, to grab the collections of animal and plant germplasm, uh, the, the basic genetic material that gets used in coming up with the next variety. Because the agencies that hold those collections, it's like a library. You know, you hold lots of stuff, not knowing quite which ones are really valuable but it's the collection of accumulated knowledge over time. And it's expensive to maintain those things, but it's a public good. Nobody really wants to pay for it. Everybody wants somebody else to pay for it. So they're chronically underfinanced. And in the stresses that came after the global recession of 2008, 2009, the financing for these germplasm accessions began to collapse. And the Chinese and a couple of companies began to step in and offer to pay for them, but to then control the intellectual property associated with them, which causes some real concern about an anti-commons, that now, rather than it being common property, it, it actually causes complications. So hopefully one thing that's come through by now is that this relationship between food security and food prices, on the one hand, and sociopolitical stability, is a very complicated relationship. And it remains poorly understood. 
And the scientist in me is very reticent to speak out about it because we don't have a whole collection of really good statistical studies that will establish clean causal relationships that the price rises in place A and the following happens and that's a causal effect. There's so many unobservables that are make it very hard to make clean inferences and to truly tease out the causal links. But we can't really afford to wait. We can't wait for the science to become clear because we know that these correlations are there. We know that there is real unrest and we know that this is an opportunity. And I say that in a perhaps slightly uh, manipulative way, because it's easy to make the case for making peace. And we know that sociopolitical crisis, that war is a primary driver of food insecurity. It is very hard to grow good crops, to pr produce productive animals, and especially to distribute food in places that are at war. And this is the primary reason why the main episodes of famine and severe acute malnutrition around the world are in places suffering conflict. Think Somalia 2011, where the conflict, the, the famine declared in the southern states of Somalia in 2011 wasn't due to a, a serious drought. That serious drought happened also just over the border in Kenya and just over the northern border in Ethiopia in places where I work very intensively. The problem in Somalia was Al-Shabaab. The problem was a terrorist group that attacks convoys of relief agencies and that prevents traders from entering an area and even tries to prevent people from leaving the area to go to refugee camps. And that's why we were seeing mass mortality in southern Somalia in 2011. And it's why we see horrific problems in southern Sudan today where there's just horrible civil war. We know that war and, and unrest cause food insecurity. They cause human suffering. We don't really need more arguments to convince the State Department or the Department of Defense to try to help out in quelling war. Telling them that more people are going hungry because there's civil war doesn't really move the dial at all. But the opposite might not be true. The idea that food security might cause conflict and that if we don't begin to reinvest in food systems that we may be undermining our own efforts to secure peace around the world. That part of the secret of maintaining that long peace in the post-war period was massive and highly successful investments in food systems that generated historically unprecedented improvements in human living conditions, especially manifest in improvements in nutrition. But in trying to get governments to make policy responses to address food security, we have to be very careful that we don't get what we asked for and get rapid policy response that is ill thought out and actually aggravates the underlying problems, like leasing out a third of your farmland to a foreign corporation and undoing the agricultural economy of Madagascar as a result. So the, the ultimate punchline of, of this book is that it's really important to coordinate donor, meaning government and philanthropic foundation, and firm responses. So I spent a lot of time talking to, I, what, on this trip I was up in Seattle talking to the Gates Foundation. I was talking with a couple of major firms in, in San Francisco. I spent a lot of time trying to talk with people who make major decisions that affect the global food economy, trying to convince them that there are good and bad ways to respond. Respond, yes, but some responses are, are a real problem. And we want to be sure to avoid the bad ones. So that's what's summarized in this book, um, which is a collection of 18 chapters, some of them divided into thematic chapters that cut across geographies, uh, like talking about land and land deals, Klaus Deininger at the World Bank, and others that are geographically organized around regions or in some places where the regions are massive, like China, a single country. The core that comes out of those 18 chapters is that there are four main pathways by which food security impacts sociopolitical stability, and that those four pathways have really important policy implications we need to pay attention to. So the first I've already mentioned, food price spikes causing urban unrest. This is not a good thing, but it's really easy to exaggerate the role this plays. 
This is what attracts attention because it's very easy for the media to shoot video footage of rioters in a street. But this is not where the real human suffering is taking place unless this turns into outright civil war and government overthrow and other problems. The people who take to the streets in, in urban settings in food riots are not the poor. They're not the chronically malnourished young children in small villages who suffer most from food price hikes. So this isn't an automatic correlation that as prices go up, people are hurt. Those people, because they're really badly hurt, take to the streets. It's typically the middle class and young unemployed men who take to the, to take to the street. People have other grievances against the government. This is one more insult to them. It's one more way in which the government is demonstrating that it is not honoring a social compact. I noted, I noted for you before that in that graphic where I showed food price riots, there were no Latin American countries on there. Latin America, by 2008, had nearly ubiquitous social protection programs. They had a range of large-scale cash transfer programs for the poor that provided a highly publicized and generally pretty effective safety net. If someone got really poor, if food prices went high, if people lost their jobs, there was a basic safety net. The government was going to give them some rather modest, but some basic level of cash. And people had confidence that this was really going to happen, that their families weren't going to starve. And that social protection was a crucial ingredient in Latin America of taking the steam out of the system when food prices did go up, but the pressure wasn't as bad. And the governments weren't faced with revolt as a result of people feeling the social compacts were violated. What was taking place in North Africa was urban middle classes who had enjoyed massive government subsidies of bread based off of subsidized imported Ukrainian and Russian wheat were now seeing those subsidies cut because the balance of payments pressure is put on the governments by those subsidies in the face of rising food prices, rising wheat prices. And they were suddenly seeing higher bread prices at the same time as the governments weren't, del weren't delivering jobs for their children when they were graduating from secondary school or university, at the same time that the infrastructure was falling apart, at the same time that they were oppressing uh, oppressing minority groups within the country and others. And so the problems of food price spikes in urban areas are really proximate causes. They're not root causes. They can mobilize groups who are already angry, who already have some deep-seated grievances. And if there's a political opposition ready to pounce on that, that will use that moment to help coalesce a group, then they can overthrow a government. But in, there, you don't have a chaotic emergence spontaneously of people who suddenly have seen their pocketbooks hit who overthrow the government. It's based off of a much more organized, long-standing set of grievances. Um, the, the real issue there is the symbolism of the food price spike. Uh, and it's, it's, it's measure of showing the government's lack of support for the population, and it feeds off of the psychosocial role that food plays. So the second and much more important pathway, as I've already mentioned, is the intensified competition for rural resources. These are much slower evolving, so they're harder to detect. So they don't get CNN coverage, because it's, it's not easy to go out and videotape farmers who are pushing back as a company is coming in and it's trying to measure out land and it's beginning to clear and level land so that it can mechanize what used to be 50 farmers, small farms, it's going to turn into one large mechanized farm. You don't see the coverage of this. You don't see the coverage of the increasing disputes over water access. So these sorts of, of slow bubbling up of protests over resources are much more slow to evolve, but they are much deeper seated. They're much harder to eradicate. Um, these are distributional questions. These are contests over who gets the resource and who's going to keep the resource. And once it's transferred, it's very hard to get it back. When a price comes up, the price can come back down, or the government can introduce a subsidy where it didn't already exist. It's very hard once ownership over land has been seized by one party to transfer it back, or when the fishing rights of a particular area have suddenly been trampled by people coming in. It's very hard to, to, to reestablish that this is my area. This is aggravated by 
contests that are influenced by outside actors too. So we have a lot of problems in the developing world over international NGOs and governments that come in with very strong feelings about particular issues like land grabs, like genetically modified foods. In 2002, I was involved in, I've done a lot of work on international food aid and emergency food assistance. And in 2002, I was involved in a, in a fairly serious drought that was taking place in Southern Africa. And the United States government stepped up and provided genetically modified corn. And it provided corn because that was the primary staple of Southern Africa. They provided genetically modified corn because we can't sort genetically modified from not genetically modified corn in the main commercial systems in the US, and most corn in the United States is genetically modified. And all US food aid at that time had to be bought in and shipped from the United States. So your only option if you were gonna answer the call to provide corn, maize, for these populations was send GM corn. The Europeans protested. In 2002, they were especially uh, anxious about genetic modification of food and they threatened several governments in Southern Africa that if they accepted US food aid shipments, that this would compromise their trade relationships with Europe, et cetera. Now, a couple of countries then stopped their receipt of US food aid until the South Africans stepped in and said, well, listen, part of the problem here is the Europeans are worried that some people will take the corn because it was shipped largely in granular form, which can also double as seed, and that some people will plant it, and then once you have genetically modified corn maize in the ecosystem, that it's hard to control. So the South Africans said, well, let us mill it, because people aren't gonna actually eat the grains, they're gonna eat the maize meal. So we'll mill it, we'll contribute the milling. The grain arrives at Port in Durban, we'll mill it, we'll ship the maize meal into Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and Angola, and Malawi. And all countries other than Zambia agreed to this because it obviated this problem of GM foods in their own agroecosystems. The Zambian government protested saying that GM food was a potential risk to human health. So is starvation. And they were, by the way, also allowing the feeding of this exact same food aid to Angolan refugees in Zambia. So it was clearly not an absolute concern about this. But what was really going on was they were subject to enormous political pressure coming from Europe at that time, that if they accepted genetically modified food, that the Europeans might withhold aid, they might make it much more difficult for Zambia to export agricultural products into Europe. And this wound up complicating enormously land and water issues in rural Zambia too, because now you had lots of issues over farmers who were interested in perhaps exploring new varieties that might be more stress tolerant that they wouldn't necessarily suffer the same yield losses from drought as they just had, but the environment was complicated a lot by external politics. The third pathway by which food prices and food security can impact sociopolitical stability after food price spikes in urban areas and the competition for rural resources is improved technologies. And by that I mean that as we increase the supply of food we produce and the throughput of that food to urban areas, increase, the world is now majority urban and the fastest rates of urbanization are in Africa and Asia, the places where the fastest rates of consumption growth are generally. As we increase productivity growth in these areas per unit of land, per unit of water, per worker, we begin to have supply growth catch up to demand growth which is the underlying structural problem here. Demand growth outpacing supply growth since the year 2000. So the growing disparity in rates of technical change in agriculture around the world. In the United States, we've seen a resurgent growth of, of, uh, of productivity in agriculture, largely with the rise of, of genetically modified crops, um, BT cotton, BT corn, BT Roundup Ready soy, et cetera. Um, but that same technological advance in agriculture isn't taking place everywhere. It's very rapid in places like India and China where they make significant investments in ag R&D. There have been major policy reforms to put more control in the hands of farmers. The, China, the Chinese government no longer tells farmers 
what it will plant, how much land it will plant, what it will sell, how much the price will be, et cetera. Uh, giving more control to farmers has significantly increased agricultural productivity in China, Vietnam, several other formerly state-managed agricultural economies. But in much of Sub-Saharan Africa and many other countries in South and Southeast Asia, we don't see very rapid technological change, and that's one of the real challenges, because that's where the demand growth is. And one really important thing to keep in mind about food systems is that 85 to 90 percent of the food consumed in the world was grown in the country in which it's eaten. Food is the ultimate local product for the very simple reason that its value to bulk ratio is very low. Food is really expensive to transport long distances. We can do it for high margin products, and we can do it at the margin through trade to provide, for example, soy feed for hogs in China. But the bulk of the food consumed was grown within the country in which it's eaten, commonly grown within about 250 kilometers of the place in which it's eaten because of perishability, because of the added cost of transport, especially when oil prices are high. They're not right now. And so when demand growth due to income growth, population growth, and urbanization is disproportionately in sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia, productivity growth also has to be disproportionately in those places. We have to match them up. We can use trade. American farmers, North American farmers, both US and Canadian, are the most productive in the world. And we're massive agricultural exporters, and we will continue to be, and that's a good thing for the world. But we will never be the main sources of supply. Our productivity helps to anchor the world prices, but the America feeds the world adage is misleading at best, and possibly worse if it distracts us from thinking that we also have to invest in improving the productivity of farmers in Africa and Asia. If we think we can get by just investing in American agricultural productivity, and this will resolve the sorts of problems I've discussed, we're kidding ourselves. We've got to increase productivity in those areas. So the big area where there's a policy lever that can take some of the heat off besides kind of better regulation of access to rural resources, clear property rights, transparent transfers of, of land or water rights where that, those transfers occur. The big policy lever is around investing and improving the availability of high productivity technologies that are also environmentally sustainable in Africa and Asia. We are seeing dramatic changes in the competitive landscape for developing technologies. The life sciences industries have been going through incredibly rapid change over the last 20 years, especially since the Supreme Court upheld the patentability of life forms, uh, which has meant that there's an enormous competition to be able to patent new varieties uh, and to reap the, 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 the financial gains that come from IP in genetic technologies. Um, GM is an extremely controversial very promising and very dangerous set of technologies. And I, I say that intentionally that way because I personally cannot see a path to a food secure future without the careful use of, of transgenic technologies and some basic crops, partly for stress resistance, partly to improve the availability of minerals and vitamins for populations who have a difficult time accessing minerals and vitamins. But at the same time, it is a real source of concern for gene flow. Without adequate biosafety protocols in place, and in many African and some Asian countries, they have a difficult time implementing a good regulatory environment so they can implement proper biosafety to limit gene flow. Um, we need to manage and, and watch GM carefully. But GM is taking off across the developing world anyway. I mean, most of the acreage planted in transgenic crops in the world today is in low and middle income countries. We think about it as a North American phenomenon because those technologies were almost entirely developed in North America, mainly in the US. But the rapid spread of genetically modified crops has been overwhelmingly in the developing world, especially in cotton. BT cotton is, is everywhere in Asia and Africa in the cotton growing belts. So technological change isn't a panacea, but this is one of the key levers. 
And I want to emphasize, too, it's not just the production level technologies, it's also the distribution technologies. It's how do we make sure that the food grown on farms makes its way to people's plates in cities. So squeezing the costs out, improving the logistics of food distribution, much of which is around electrification. It's maintaining refrigeration for perishable products. It's mean, you know, increasing the capacity to process product closer to where it's grown. So we spend less time and money transporting straw, stofer, and other inedible parts of, of crops. And more of the, the dollar spent by a consumer is spent on consumable product processed commonly in rural areas. But they need the basic infrastructure to do that. So the technological levers available to philanthropies, to governments, and to private firms are really one of the crucial things in addressing the threat to socio-political stability caused by food insecurity that itself is partly a byproduct of neglect, of complacency that came in the 90s and earlier part of this millennia. So then the fourth pathway, policy matters here, not just policies around resources and food price subsidies and technologies, but policies that governments use to try to manage these crises. And there are two in particular that I want to single out as incredibly tempting to governments and incredibly damaging. The first is export barriers. So when rice prices spiked in 2008, the Indian government immediately slapped on a rice export ban. The Egyptian government did the same. And the idea was prices are rising. We want to protect our domestic consumers. We're not going to let our growers or our processors export product that will trap supply within the country, bring down domestic prices. This is all true. That's pretty basic economics. The problem is that that is what we sometimes refer to in economics as a beggar thy neighbor policy that you're, you're imposing this policy that causes harm on your neighbors. And as a lot of other countries start doing this, the effect is that prices come up anyway. Price volatility comes up anyway. And so the price rises filter back into the economy indirectly while promoting black market trade, obviously. And you have a little bit of the same effect you have if you go to a, I don't know how many of you have ever gone to an English Premier League football match in Britain. And you notice they pay a lot of money for tickets. And they never actually sit in the seats. Have you ever noticed that? So I'm a, I'm a big Arsenal fan. And I took one of my daughters to an Arsenal match at Emirates Stadium a number of years ago. And I was amazed at how much I had to pay for these tickets. And I was even more amazed when right after the opening kickoff, something good happened. And a bunch of the fans jumped out of their seats. And they stand in there cheering. And they don't sit back down. So of course, everybody else has to stand to see. And at the end of the day, nobody's any better off. In fact, we're all worse off because our legs are tired at the end of a full 90-minute match. And you've gotten to see no more than you would have if you stayed seated. Export bans are a bit like that. It's a standing up in the stadium phenomenon. One country does it, the next country does it. And pretty soon, you've just got trade barriers all over the place that are mucking up the market. And in the end of the day, very few countries are actually better off for this. But the global trade regime has been destabilized. The markets have become thinner, and price volatility has increased. Export bans are a really dumb idea. Um, and we have no good mechanism to prohibit them. The Doha round WTO negotiations were begun in 2001. And remember that graphic I showed you on real food prices? Remember, it hit its all-time low around 2000, 2001. At that time, we were worried about low prices, not high prices. So all the disciplines in the trade regimes are around high prices. Trade policy is a really dangerous implement to be using in addressing food price spikes. Governments were doing it, and yet we're trying to, many of us are trying to get them to stop. And the basic problem is you're not creating increased supply. If the structural problem is, demand growth outpacing supply growth, you either got to bring demand down or bring supply up. Just reallocating it doesn't change anything. The same is true for buffer stock policies, which are one of the other, uh, one of the other uh, instruments being used by many governments. The real problem of, of, of buffer stock policy and export ban policy is it leads policymakers to the facile conclusion that they've solved the problem, that they've done something. 
And it gives them an easy out so that they don't invest in the longer run structural solutions necessary through accelerating, again, supply growth, improved distribution channels. If you let policymakers think that they've solved a problem with a quick fix that's merely rearranging the deck chairs, you don't really get very far. Um, social protection I already mentioned before. So let me start winding up by just reiterating that there is not hard conclusive scientific evidence that episodes of food insecurity spark violence, government overthrow, episodes of socio-political instability generally, but there is enough circumstantial evidence, enough strong association to believe that that really is a causal relationship probably and that we need to address it, that policymakers really have to stimulate agricultural productivity growth, improve food distribution systems, improve social protection policies, and it has to be done in Africa and Asia above all because that's where the demand growth is gonna be over the coming generations. We've seen in the past, in the post-World War II era for roughly 40 years, that we can achieve phenomenal progress, historically unprecedented progress in the performance of food systems that delivers major advances in living standards and generalized prosperity and peace. We're in a different era now. We've got bigger challenges around climate change, around stricter intellectual property regimes, et cetera, than we had back then. And we've got major macroeconomic issues with major donor governments, especially in Europe, such that they're less willing to invest in the global public goods than they were back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But if we don't address the challenge, we face a very real prospect of unrest. That's exactly what led the intelligence services to approach me and ask me to convene that group of authors to provide expert commentary on the different stresses in the global food system that seem to lead to socio-political instability. That's what that book is. It's the byproduct of what the national intelligence system asked for. Um, and one of the key takeaway messages that collectively we were trying to give them is don't focus just on American agriculture. Don't make the mistake of thinking that we can take care of these problems by investing in greater corn production, soy production, wheat production in the US. You gotta focus in Africa and Asia. Um, how you do it matters. I won't go back over the details. I've already, I already raised them. I thank you for your interest. I look forward to some of your questions and carrying on the conversation. Thank you very much. I think, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, while, while the audience is formulating their questions and the questions are being uh, collected, uh, there are some questions that, that uh, Chris can ad address in the meantime. And the, uh, the first one, Chris, and I think you started on it uh, in your summation here, is that, that a major element of US agricultural policy is crop subsidies to domestic producers. What, what are the positive and negative effects on farmers and consumers in the developing world? Okay. Um, so the United States is a massive subsidizer of its farm sector. Relative to Europe, Japan, even now China, per farmer, we're actually surprisingly miserly. Um, I mean, farm subsidies are a natural device for many governments. The core result of farm subsidies is you expand supply and you bring down prices. And so if you believe my general story that things that expand supply on the margin are good, lower food prices help poor people to be able to access a diet, that's all good. The complications arise from two factors. One is that these are typically very inefficient ways to generate supply expansion. A dollar spent by the US government on crop subsidies, and increasingly after the most recent farm bill, it's really on crop insurance. So you're, you're subsidizing insurance programs much more so than direct payments. But whatever the form of the subsidy, the dollar spent on the subsidies the US government employs right now typically generate a relatively modest fraction of the supply expansion in, in crop or animal output. 
relative to investing the same amount in technologies and distribution systems. The second complication, which matters mainly for a product like cotton, it's much less an issue for food crops, is that increased US productivity or Chinese productivity or uh, Canadian productivity due to, to subsidies to farm sectors drives down prices. And for the farmers who grow those crops in developing countries, that hits them in the pocketbook. That means they get lower income. Now, most farmers, most small poor farmers in Africa and Asia are actually net buyers of food. So it's a little counterintuitive that low food prices on balance are actually good things for small farmers because they're spending more on food than they're earning from food and they, at the margin, actually benefit from lower prices. That's not true in cash crops like cotton, where they're unambiguously worse off. So cotton subsidies in the US are probably the single most damaging farm policy we have for small farmers in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. Another question. Uh, some food aid agencies are now giving money and people to buy local foods instead of sending food from the US. What, what do you think of this? <laughs> I've been a very passionate advocate for what's known as a local and regional procurement, LRP, for a long time. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the US government from Public Law 480 agreed or signed into law in 1954 by President Eisenhower dictated that all US food aid had to be bought in and shipped from the United States. Now that's a really strange way to deliver food because in most of the world you can buy basic grains much cheaper than you can in the United States once you include shipment costs. And the delay is incredible. So the median time to delivery of emergency food aid in the United States is almost five months. So my group has done very careful controlled studies based on a pilot program that Congress authorized in 2008 where we found that local procurement of food or regional procurement of food will on average reduce delivery times by about 14 weeks, which if you're waiting for dinner, 14 weeks is a lot less time to wait. Uh, and it reduced the cost of procurement of delivered grains by almost 50% in landlocked countries. So you just get a lot bigger bang for the taxpayer dollar. You get much faster delivery. You don't lose anything in terms of food safety and quality. It's just a no-brainer to do this. It's just politically difficult because there are interest groups in Washington that don't like the idea of using US taxpayer dollars to buy food in developing countries and cutting out the shippers who move the food and some of the agribusinesses who sell it in the US. But in terms of how to effectively use our taxpayer dollars for humanitarian response in the developing world, local and regional procurement is absolutely one of the chief tools to use. Sorry, that's very partisan, but I've done a lot of research on this, and the evidence is absolutely unambiguous okay. on this. And that this wasn't point. a planted question either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, th I think it's time to go into the GMO area. Okay. Uh, GMOs can decrease pesticide use decrease drought risk, and increase production. But their use is increasingly opposed. Will this pressure lead to more food insecurity? Yes, is the simple answer to the question as posed. Um, again, there are risks with GM, uh, transgenics in particular. So there, genetic modification is a broad term. The thing that really worries people is crossing the natural reproductive boundary, taking a gene from one species putting it into a different one. Um, and there are real risks. I mean, we've seen problems of mutation of weeds as they're acquiring some of the genetic material from genetically modified crops. So this is not without risk, but it is in a crucial, er a cru crucial, crucial arrow in our quiver uh, as, we, as we take on the food security challenge. And the big, the big benefits are gonna come in two forms. One is the prospect of delivery of, of minerals and vitamins. Many of you have probably heard of golden rice. So golden ri rice is the single most consumed commodity in the world. The poorest populations of Asia and Africa commonly depend upon rice and can't afford fruits, vegetables, and animal, animal source foods in adequate volume to provide vitamin A 
And so we see very high rates of xerophthalmia, of blindness induced by vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A deficiency is the leading cause of blindness in children in the world. Getting vitamin A into the diets of rice consuming children is the fastest path we have to reducing blindness. Scientists figured out how to pull a gene out of a daffodil, that beautiful yellow daffodil, the gene that expresses the beta carotene that gives it that yellow hue can be inserted into the rice genome and produce rice that likewise will emit a little bit of a golden glow, hence the term golden rice. Golden rice has the potential to help us to solve the vitamin A deficiency problem among rice consuming populations. It is staunchly opposed by a whole host of environmental groups that are anti-GM that have gone to the fields and destroyed experimental plots of golden rice in the Philippines because they think that this is doing damage while there are children going blind in the neighboring villages. I don't understand why people can't see the prospect for genetic modification that enables us to express, uh, express proteins in, in core staple commodities that provide minerals and vitamins for diets that otherwise lack them. That's the big future of, of genetic modification in food systems. The other is protecting foods we already eat and like. How many of you would like your grandchildren or great-grandchildren to be able to eat banana and papaya? Without genetic modification, my grandchildren are not going to eat banana and papaya because those crops are subject to viri for which there is no known resistance within the family. We cannot create naturally propagated banana or papaya that will resist black cigatoka or papaya ring spot virus. The only way we've been able to solve that problem is through transgenics. So papaya ring spot virus was addressed by Cornell plant pathologists and plant breeders using gene guns, taking a protein from a bacterium and putting it right into the papaya to breed resistance and solve that problem. And the papaya industry in Hawaii is much better for it. We will not have some crops without transgenics because of the constant evolution of pests and pathogens. So unless you want that natural extinction, you need to be prepared to support GM for some purposes. Next question. What, what is the effect of diverting food to other uses, such as ethanol? It's a problem. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of obvious at some level that if you take a third of the US corn supply and you move it into gas tanks, that's going to have an adverse effect on global corn prices. And that's going to hurt people who struggle to be able to feed their families and who depend upon maize. Um, thankfully, we seem to be moving increasingly out of corn-based ethanol as the technologies of second and third generation biofuel feedstocks are emerging. So the competition between biofuels and food seems to be on the wane. But it's not happening quickly enough. Um, there's a fabulous book out recently by a couple of my colleagues at Cornell, Harry DeGorder and David Just, and their former student, Dushan Drebek, have a new book out on biofuels and agricultural commodity prices that just does a brilliant job of laying out exactly how the biofuel economy works and how it propagates price increases into commodity markets. Uh, and why we're having trouble in managing this. So anyone who really wants to go into detail, it's not a highly technical book, but it digests very technical material into a very accessible form. So De Gorder et al., it's a 2015 book. It's actually out just the last few months. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a wide range of questions, and, and um, this one deals with water, okay. and specifically California. California's water situation impacts everyone. What solution do you see when the farmer and farmers and people compete for the water? Um, California's situation has been building for a long time. Uh, my, my mother is a war refugee from the Netherlands, and when my grandparents resettled here, my grandfather became a, a farmer. If any of you know the Los Angeles area, Imagine an egg farm in Van Nuys. I don't think there are any anymore. <laughs> Believe it or not, my grandfather was an egg farmer in Van Nuys in the early 50s. Um, water was a problem then. I remember talking with him about 
and, and, and layers, egg production is not the most water intensive of farming activities. It doesn't hold a candle to things like almonds or, or tomatoes. Um, water has been a real problem in California for a long time. We've, we've and, and it's not just California. The Ganges Basin in India is a very serious problem with water as well for the same reason, water pricing. That if you've promoted water as if it has no substitute use, you've promoted extremely low cost access to water, you induce a use rate of water that's unsustainable. And with residential growth and other industrial growth in India and in California, we've seen that the competition for water has grown acute. Uh, agriculture is the biggest user. Agriculture accounts for about 90, 90, 94% of water use in the developing world. It's overwhelmingly agriculture uh, of, of, of uh, clean water use. We're now seeing aquifers that are, are drying up. We're seeing cyanide poisoning as you draw water down in aquifers and change the underlying ground chemistry. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of problems emerging from unsustainable water use. California produce growers are going to have to figure out how to deal with a higher water price regime. I don't, I don't see how we can possibly manage without starting to price water appropriately in California. That will benefit you know, growers here in Colorado. In eastern Colorado, fruit growers here are going to benefit as competition from, from California recedes a bit. Um, it's not going to have an enormous effect on the global food supply. I mean, the water problems are real, but the water pricing issues in California aren't really going to impact Africa and Asia much. Let's go back to your first slide. What, what is the true carrying capacity of our planet? <laughs> At what population level do we truly experience unrest? Good question. Out of sample predictions are not my specialty. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the best population projections now say that we're, we're going to add a billion people in the next 10 years, probably a billion more in the 15 to 18 years after that, and then we'll plateau someplace, depending upon whose projections you believe, somewhere between 9.5 and 11 billion people will plateau at that sometime at the end of this century, roughly. Uh, you know, we're seeing very rapid decreases in fertility rates in most countries around the world. Um, and so right now, the population growth problems are almost irreversible because we're not seeing, I mean, leave out a few relatively small countries like Niger where women still have on average six children. Leave out a very small number of countries that have a really serious family planning problem. And most of the world, the fertility rates are hovering around replacement level. The problem is the people already born. And it's not clear what you do about that. I'm not sure I have a good policy response, a palatable policy response to the massive population of youth that presently exist in Africa and Asia and Latin America. They are going to continue to age, and we are going to continue to have extended life expectancy for older people in the developing world. And because the fertility rates come down, quickly, but the mortality rates came down even quicker, you see population growth expands pretty quickly. And the, the horse is sort of out of the barn already on population growth. And we'll see how much problem it creates. From my perspective, there's not much we can do other than marginal tinkering. I'm a big proponent of family planning programs, by the way, in developing countries where we still have high fertility rates. But that's not going to make a, a difference that you're going to ever discern in global numbers. So at this point, what we mainly need to do is figure out how do we best accommodate the population we've already got, because we're not going to get rid of them in any way that I would want to imagine. So. We, we have time for one I, more I question. Should, I, I should clarify. Okay. Truth in advertising, I have five children, too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so keep, keep in mind, I can't possibly be a zero population growth guy. <laughs> Well, we, we have time for one more question. And you did answer the phone call from the CIA. Yeah. <laughs> but I think we have here one from the White House. OK. How do we deal with rogue governments such as ISIL, who disrupt both supply and distribution of food to populations in need? So, uh, there's a British economist named Paul Collier. Uh, 
who has a famous book out a couple of years ago called The Bottom Billion. Any of you who are really interested in global poverty reduction, I highly recommend Paul Collier's Bottom Billion. It's a terrific book. In that book, Paul makes the case that the best development investments ever made were military intervention in times of civil war. He's told the British government that the best development investment you've made in West Africa was ending the civil war in Sierra Leone by bringing in the British military. Peacekeeping really matters. Um, now, how you do that with non-state actors, I mean, Sierra Leone was a different situation because you had a civil war between clear demar clearly demarcated parties who were contesting uh, control of the state. ISIL is a completely different beast than most of us have seen, um, and a really scary one. But we have to be prepared to, to stand up to it. Um, ignoring it, pretending that it's not a serious threat, I don't see as a solution. Now again, full disclosure, I was an Army officer. I grew up in the military. My dad was a career Marine. So maybe you just think that I have this kind of intrinsic militaristic streak in my DNA. Um, but I spend a lot of time in places where, places where I work in northern Kenya, you can buy an AK-47 for $25. I see 10-year-olds walking around with semi-automatic weapons fairly routinely. It's scary stuff. Um, we've simply got to get control of small arms, and we have to get control of those who organize people with small arms who oftentimes don't even understand what they're doing with them. Um, you know, kids who are doped up on cut, uh, so it's a narcotic that you'll chew when you're hungry. Kids doped up on cot walking around with AK-47s, which is, is part of Al-Shabaab's MO in, in the Horn of Africa. Um, I mean, we simply have to be prepared to stand up to them militarily. And they're wreaking havoc for populations that are extremely vulnerable, and they cause problems that propagate elsewhere. You know, places like Nairobi, when I, I was in Nairobi in, in April, and um, you know, the, the basic f road infrastructure is completely knotted up with security patrols because they're terrified of further Al-Shabaab attacks. And that has immediate effects on food prices, on people getting to jobs, on everything. Um, I don't see how we, we have a very viable future without having a fairly aggressive approach to groups like ISIL. Thank you, Chris. And let's uh, give them a hand. Okay. And thank you very much for coming. Okay. Chris, thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.